Hi, we're here today with Ricardo Arias Knapp. He's a Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Pepsi. And we're here to ask him a couple questions uh, about marketing and about branding and about anything else that kind of comes to our minds. How has the Chief Marketing Officer position changed over, say, the past 10 or 20 years with respect to digital and, and social media and all those kind of things? It's a great question, and it has changed dramatically. Um, reality is, if you go back 20, 30 years, it was actually, I would say, fairly easy to do marketing uh, in the sense that you had a couple of TV stations that you had to deal with, maybe some radio, maybe some print. But at the end of the day, it was a, coming up with four very good, uh, expensive pieces of, of, of advertising that you would use throughout the year. And you would have four pieces of ads. You would probably focus on four you know, different TV channels or, or print outlets. And, and that was pretty much it. You know, it's, it, that's where people understood about the brands. There was a lot of consolidation in terms of media. And when you look at the landscape today, it's completely different. You, you need to be talking to your audience very frequently. You have to use multiple mediums and uh, either be it Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat. You know, these are the types of places where consumers are at the moment. And the type of messages that you send them are extremely different. So that's, that's the first component. The second component is with the growth of analytics, uh, it makes it much more easier to understand who you should be talking to and what you should be saying. And you have the, uh, the ability to do that and ha to have different conversations with different audiences. That was not possible 20 years ago. So that changes the way in which you do everything, the way in which you structure a marketing team, the way in which you put together the content that you're going to be using, um, the way in which you track analytics of what you're doing. Uh, concepts like, you know, share voice, for example, they have a completely different meaning now. Concepts such as reach and frequency. Before you have, you know, you just talk about GRPs and how your reach and frequency, you would add it all together. Now it's reach continues to be extremely important, but frequency it's different. You cannot be showing the same message again and again and again. So it's more about building stories. And that's how you do the frequency. You do it in a programmatic way. And you, and you mentioned the teams too have changed, right? The idea that now the team has to, I assume, be not just expanded, but it's a different type of team. Completely. First of all, you have to have a completely new set of, of, um, of capabilities um, on the analytics front, which before it, it was not. Um, you know, I, I tend to say that the uh, mar marketing is really becoming a, a, a science. You know, before it was more of an art. Now it's progressively becoming more and more of a science. And, um, but it's in, it's in very early stages. You know, it took a lot of sciences, you know, centuries to become what they are. Marketing, we're just starting. And when you do that, con that construct, at the end, you have to have people that are much more technical in what they're doing in understanding consumers and how they react to content. So, Teams today, it's not necessarily people coming out of the advertising world or industry. There's a lot of people coming in from uh, the, the sciences. And um, before, you used to have a situation in which marketing talent was built in companies primarily in, in the consumer products arena. Um, you know, Unilever's, P&G, Pepsi's. You know, these were the places or in the schools of thought for marketing. And then they went to different industries. What you're seeing now, it's kind of a little bit of a reverse because everything that has direct response involved, being insurance, banking, telcos, they have more data and more, and, and more things that you can react to. So what's happening is that talent these days sometimes comes from those industries, and we're trying to bring them in into the consumer side of, of the equation because it's, it's where you know, marketing is heading to. As far as branding goes, and of course, there's a lot of people out there, I think, that, that get a little bit confused when we talk about branding versus marketing or, or how branding is part of marketing or marketing is part of branding, whatever you want to say. And um, I think in the digital environment, a lot of people feel like that the digital has really helped the small and medium sized businesses to really compete. But as far as a worldwide and ubiquitous brand such as Pepsi, um, what has that digital and social done with respect to branding and what are the challenges that you face with that? Well, th there, is, um, there are a couple of things. I, I do think that the growth of, of digital has enabled smaller players to come in and, and, and compete because, again, you, you don't have to deal with you know, big TV stations or networks. You just can do, if you do the right things, you can get your share of voice in, a, in, in an affordable, affordable way. 
for large companies like us, and not only you know Pepsi, but you know the rest of our portfolio, Gatorade, Naked, Trop, um, it 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 has helped a lot for many of our brands because we have been able to use some of those uh, th- those tools to grow you know brands that were typically smaller. Take a brand like uh, Naked Juice, for example. It's a brand that you know we want to develop it. It was becoming a billion dollar brand every year. And um, and for Naked, it was dif- difficult to compete in a traditional structure of, of media. With the growth of these new channels, you can be much more, you know, you can do much better segmenting, focusing on different occasions of consumption. And with that, you, you have a much higher effective rate. So the, you know, the, the, the effectiveness of the media buy is much better than it was before. For larger brands, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge and not necessarily because, because of the things that you communicate, but also because of the exposure that you have very quickly, things can come wrong very quickly, you know, and, and you know, we had an example last year of, of, of one of the campaigns that were done in North America where it became, uh, because of different opinions, very fast, it, it turned against us in a way, and it was obviously no, no intention about it. So it, 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 you have to be extremely careful in this new world, not only about what you're communicating, but how third parties are communicating about your brands and how they are reacting with the things you do. So you have to be um, very conscious of that. And, and I agree. I think there's a lot of challenges there that people weren't facing 10 or 20 years ago because if people talked, they only talked to be amongst themselves and now they're talking to an entire world. Yeah. More and more marketers are, are understanding that that distribution, especially if you're in the, the reselling side of things or, or if you're a, a manufacturer and you're going to sell out to the consumers, that the distribution is a key element in marketing. We all know that. Um, I think more and more marketers now are trying to understand how they can use marketing skills in the B2B type of an environment when they're trying to get that out there. And not just necessarily from the selling side, but actually from the marketing and the branding side. So how does that work? It's crucial. When you look at our industry, it's obviously, I would say, more than 50% of what you do is around distribution, but even in, in new te- in new industries, technology, um, you know, internet has made you know distribution for a good product or concept ubiquitous, so it's it's easy. And we we have a framework that we talk about for a brand to be successful. You have to have um, physical availability and mental availability. Those are like two critical factors for a brand to be successful. And I'm, I'll start with the second one. Mental availability is what we always have thought about marketing and branding and making sure you have, you know, your media weights in the right place so that people can see you and get exposure to it. But the reality is that if there is no physical availability, there is, you know, you, you don't have a brand. And we know from experience, you know, what made people drink Pepsi, you know, being able to get a Pepsi. It's, it's as, as simple as that. So and the other component there is, uh, especially in fast mover consumer goods industries, we know that 40 to 50% of the decision, um, uh, you know, the, the moment of truth happens at the store, happens in front of, of, uh, of, of the checkout. Or in, so not being there, not having that distribution becomes a, a massive problem for, for any other brand. So when you're doing your marketing plan, you have to think of, every single step of the distribution chain. And it's not only who you sell to, making sure that whoever you're selling to is selling to the right people, making sure that you have uh, the right merchandising in place. So when you're at point of sale, you can find your brands. And it's easy for consumers to make a choice because that's another um, big issue these days. You go to any supermarket, even to a small retail store, you have so many products, so much availability that the choice it's becoming you know incrementally more complicated for consumers to do there is there's really having a tough time deciding what to buy so making sure that it's an easy decision um it's something that it's it's critical and, and fundamental so we use a lot of principles on on nudging how do you make sure and especially for us in which we're extremely focused nowadays in moving the portfolio to more nutrition and hydration offerings so how do you nudge people towards those types of offerings, right? Um, you know, we think Pepsi is a great product for certain occasions. We don't think you should be drinking Pepsi all day, every moment of the day. We'd rather you drink Aquafina for, to hydrate, or if you're doing in a sports occasion that you're drinking Gatorade or Tropicana or Naked for, for nutrition value. So how do you do that in the distribution context is also very important because you need to make sure that people are nudging towards the direction that you think it's 
better for them in the long term in in, this, in the health and wellness space particularly. And, and I would imagine that getting you know to the the, the sell to Pe- of Pepsi to the distributor is an easy sell. Yeah. I mean, everyone has to carry it. But um, I always wonder though with these other brands. Uh, you know, usually the the retailer is just thinking about margin and turnover, margin and turnover. That's Correct. what they care about. But what else is it that you do to get them to understand that these other brands that you sell are valuable to their portfolio? Well, I mean, you just mentioned margin and turnover. So some of these brands, they, the turnover is lower, but the margins could be higher, especially for them. So so it's something that it, 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 it works out um, from that perspective. But also we need to look at new distribution channels because some of the products that we're doing um, and, and we're creating, require a completely different framework in how you distribute them. We have a new offering now. We just started. It's a, uh, it's a product called Drinkfinity, and I'm not sure you have seen it, but it's a completely, it's a revolution how beverages are made. It's a, um, it's a concept of a pod and capsules, so capsules and a, and a vessel in which you have natural ingredients and you basically mix them with water. And, you know, it's, it's a revolutionary product in the way, in the sense that we are reducing the use of PET and plastics dramatically to a third. Uh, the entire footprint of distribution is much smaller because you're not, you know, you're not shipping water around, you're not shipping plastic, that gets reduced. But it also requires us to make a very different approach on, on commerce. And it's all about e-commerce. You can only buy this product through e-commerce. And so we have to be able to move away from the traditional distribu- distributing model for some of the products to something that is different. And that's why we're investing a lot on e-commerce. You know, um, recently our, 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 our chairman and CEO announced, you know, a big investment in what we're doing in the e-commerce front. And that's going to be important for those products that tend to be more in the, in, in, in the long tail and not necessarily the blockbusters. We're finally seeing big data and data analytics as being discussed a lot uh, by marketers. But I'm not sure that a lot of marketers are actually practicing this, especially with small and medium-sized businesses. And so what advice could you give to them as far as what they can actually do in practice as far as analytics? You know, I, I'm not sure that the small and, and mid-sized businesses are not doing analytics. What, what, curiously enough, I have found a lot of startups. We look at, we sometimes talk to, you know, startups and, and, and they sometimes have a better grasp of what's going on with their businesses, even than large companies. And, and, so, and, why, so, and why so? I, I think it's, it's because, it, first of all, they, they were born in, a, in an era where, where this was the norm. You know, when you think of, there's a lot of legacy in big companies. And, and we have, obviously, very good systems, you know, at PepsiCo in terms of tracking sales and tracking consumption. Um, but there's also some legacy around it. When you think of a, of a startup company, uh, most of them have, you know, we're born in an era where, you know, data has been available and it's a native thing within, within what they do. So I, I agree with you that some of the small ones don't do it, but the successful ones do. Uh, and, um, and that's important. So for, for us in a way, and I think for big companies, more of a catch up in a way than, than anything else. Now, once you, once you are able to have this data, it's very transformative because obviously when you're a large company, you can do so many things. So some of the things that we have been able to do is increase our, our, our effectiveness of, of both marketing spend and on conversion of consumption in, in dramatic ways. Um, and, you know, we're optimizing now our media spend in, in ways. We're doing a lot of geolocation marketing, for example. Um, what I like to call micro-segmentation in, in the sense that, you know, if I'm, um, for example, have, I'm advertising for the you know, Champions League, which is we're a sponsor of the Champions League soccer event, you know, I can go and talk to people that are Champions League fans or specific teams, and I can do that for um, you know, brand Pepsi in a, an allocation right before the game, and I could do it for a soccer practitioner for Gatorade uh, right after they finish their practice. So these are the type of things that once you have access to that data, you're able to do and, and do it in a much more successful way because the effectiveness is ex- way higher, three, four times higher than just going and buying a, a, a TV ad because you're doing it in the right moment with the right people. So that's, that's how we're using it. And again, I think that small companies, um, you know, kudos to them because I have seen a couple of them doing incredible work in, in this space. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times they're if they uh, they get the data, but then they sometimes don't use the data, and I think that's the catch right yeah. there for them. I, I see a lot of people who who have collected a lot, 
but they haven't used it. And I could imagine even at large companies, and you talk with a lot of your colleagues at the, a lot of the, a lot of your colleagues at the, a lot of the other large companies. And I would imagine that there's sometimes a, a difficulty in moving a large ship and making it turn versus a smaller ship. Correct. Absolutely. It's it's much easier for a for a nimble company to do these these changes and 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 adapt. We tend to keep most of our brands with an entrepreneurial flair in a way, even within the large construct of what PepsiCo is, is a you know second largest food and beverage company in the world. It's it's large, but how do we make sure that our teams are are managing with a an entrepreneurial spirit being it from our regional perspective from a brand perspective and and that that helps so it's really the layering between the distribution which yes it's pretty much across all brands but how you're conceptualizing a brand like Quaker we want to make sure that it's very different than when you're doing that for for Pepsi you know Quaker it's it's a health center brand um so there are some principles there you want to make sure that you're ring fencing and then one is not going on top of the other, even with Gatorade, you know, Gatorade, you say, well, it's it's a beverage. It's it's really not. It's it's about sports nutrition. It's about you know athletic performance. So we try to keep um, the the mental state of the people that are working in the brand very separate than from brand Pepsi. So that's that's something that we think it's important to to remain nimble and and trying to make those things happen. You know, you mentioned something about Gatorade, and I always think about the, the Gatorade ads and even the Pepsi ads. All the, the ads that a lot of companies are putting out now are much more than about the product. They're about it being inspired. They're about changing behavior. They're about changing their lives. And I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about that, um, that approach that people are using to try to do a lot more than just sell. Well, I think it goes back, you know, 40, 50 years back, we always talked about the, you know, the four P's on, on, on marketing. And what I think people are realizing, and there's a five P, which is, which is purpose. And I would say is the primary, primarily uh, the most important one of all, of all the P's, you know, because it's really, you know, why you do whatever it is that you're doing. And um, so purpose becomes a really important thing for every single brand out there and every single company, you know, it, our are basically our, our, our motto as PepsiCo these days is, you know, performance with purpose. Um, and the purpose at a corporate level, it's about transformation and it's about making the portfolio healthier, making reductions in sugar, making reductions in salt, making reductions in, in use of plastics and going to renewable materials. So that is a, it's a mind shift, but it, it starts with that purpose. You know, it's really about how you make sure you, you make a better world from both, you know, product people. Um, and planet, which are the three pieces that we use. Now, at the same time, every brand has to have a purpose. And I don't think that necessarily a, a brand purpose has to be uh, something. It's, brand purpose is not being uh, good for humanity. Some brands can do that. Some brands cannot. I mean, you take brands like um, Harley Davidson, right? It's a brand. I think they do a great job. And But, you know, the purpose of that brand is to disturb the peace, really. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a way, and they do it very well. And, and, and for the core consumer, it makes tons of sense. And they love it. And it's, it, I think it's great. But what all brands are realizing is that if, you're not, if you don't have a purpose, then it, everything comes really superfluous. And you really have to identify what that purpose is. And, again, it doesn't have to be we're going to save humanity, world peace type of purpose, but you do need to have one. And we think that each one of the brands that we have, have been defined to develop one of these purposes uh, as we move forward. Let's talk a little bit about, um, about people moving from one place to another in marketing. We have a lot of people who, they, they come to us, and whether it's students or people we, we work with, that will be maybe in the sales area of marketing and they want to move from sales and they want to get into marketing and get into the branding side, um, even though I think some of them aren't quite sure what that branding side means. But what advice could you give to them to help them make that transformation and to kind of change their career path uh, from that sales area over to the, the marketing area? Well, first thing I would say, the, the good news is that because uh, data is becoming much wider available, um, people in the sales field these days have a better chance and would be more efficient in doing marketing than people that traditionally came from the advertising side of things uh, because they know what it takes to, to do a sale. At the end of the day, nothing happens if you're not moving a case at a store. Nothing happens. There is you know, no ads. There is nothing else. So um, 
I, I would say that the good news in a way is as marketing moves to something more um, scientific, more about tying in with sales, more about understanding the funnel from you know the ad to the campaign, what that means is that you have a group of people that historically have been more focused on the sales part and looking at the numbers that can now go and, and follow this path. Now, there has to be a process in which in how you do that. And I think that sometimes the gap between sales professionals and um, what I call big and marketing professionals is, is more on the strategic side of things, is understanding not the sale of tomorrow, but how this is going to impact six months from now, a year from now, three years from now. And that is the gap that I think needs to be um, closed for, for, this, for, the, for the salespeople. Which is interesting because I do think that really good salespeople do think about that long term and it's the short-sighted ones who don't. But I, agree. I, I think I, that's happening. I, I agree. I agree. And, and, and actually, when, and even within the sales force, if you have a, people that are familiar with doing like three-year joint business plans with clients, you do get that. I, I agree that it, 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 tends, it, it tends to happen. But making sure that that is happening, I say, I would say, is the most important thing for people that are really trying to do the jump from from sales to to marketing. Likewise, for people that are in the advertising, you know, if, if you would put like <laughs> two extremes, you would have people that are just like to do ads, right? That for me, it's not necessarily marketing; it's advertising, and and you have to make a decision. It's there's nothing wrong in in wanting to be creative and doing ads. Perfectly, we we need that we need, in the industry. Do. But I think that that's the role of agencies. That's the role of what, you know, and we have incredible partnerships with our agencies that, that do that. When I look at the talent that I need for my organization, I need it to be more, more in the middle. It, people that can understand uh, how important the, the, the creative and the ads are. People that are able to produce a brief with the right data for, for you to get that, but not necessarily them being the creatives. I think a, a good marketer has to make sure that, it, that she or he uses the right creative team, uh, but it doesn't become the creative agency in a way. What do you see is the future of marketing as we move forward? Say the next five or 10 years, you know, what, are, what might be a, a, a couple of things that might change you know, relatively drastically? I think one of the things that it's going to change very quickly and very fast is uh, the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, and specifically, um, you know, both uh, voice search um, and um, and predictive, uh, even if it's not voice search, is predictive AI and how it will impact day-to-day -day consumption. And, and it goes to what keeps me up at night, by the way, in, in that sense. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm a pretty big consumer of Amazon, right? I buy a lot of things at home from Amazon. I do... Um, Auto purchase in many of the in many of the categories. Um, so, the the ability to have to, of, of choosing is is becoming less and less important because as you start doing you know more and more purchases that are continuous, it you just do it once and you just have automatic purchases that come home. So you're getting consumers uh, out of the choice in a way. And uh, I was reading an article the other day from you know um, Antonio Lucio, who is the C the CMO for uh, HP these days, and he mentioned something that I thought was very interesting. He said, you know, the brands of the the brands will be successful in the future are those that would are going to be either top of mind or top of algorithm, and I think it was a very interesting uh, thought because that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to wake up and Siri, Alexa, you know, Google, someone's going to tell you, you know what. Uh, I'm noticing you having a cold, you know, there is a discount in uh, with this specific product that it's great for this and this and that, and I can ship it home right now, or you can stop by the pharmacy and get it. So when that starts... Or, or, or a drone will deliver it for or you. Or a drone will step, deliver it right. to you. So that is going to change because, first of all, being top of algorithm, it's, it's going to be important. I mean, being on top of the recommendation that one of these AI engines are going to be delivering will change everything. Um, will change the patterns on how do you buy, when do you buy, you know, what is recommended to you. And that's going to have a lot of uh, implications because it gets to a point where you then you need to look at return on investment and advertising. If I'm not being able to influence that change in consumer behavior, why would I do advertising at all? Or what is the type of advertising I have to do to become top of algorithm, to, for example? So those things are the ones that are, I think, 
uh, are keeping um, marketers up at night at the moment. And it's how to make sure that in that new era, you're going to be able to succeed, uh, which is going to be very different than what we're accustomed to seeing these days. It's a little bit scary. <laughs> it's, you know, change is always... <laughs> It's going to happen. It's, it, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's either a threat or an opportunity, right? Uh, and, and I think that one of my favorite phrases is people change either out of, um, out of virtue or necessity, right? And, uh, you know, I think successful companies and brands uh, are the ones that do that out of virtue because if you're changing out of necessity, then it's too late. Um, so that's where we're making all of these investments in e-commerce, making sure that we are ahead of the curve, you know, that we understand better how to um, do things with our brands in terms of how they people buy, how we make them more related to experiences than just buying a box of a product or a can of a product. So those are the things where we're really spending a good deal of time. What is the reason why today's chief marketing officer should be tomorrow's chief executive officer in general? Well, I think, I think that shouldn't always be the case. Okay. I think that the best person in, in the C-suite that understands the business should take that role. Now, for specific industries, I very much think that should be the case. Um, when you look at um, FMCG, consumer products, I mean, the, at the heart of everything is the consumer. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of the role that a good marketer has to do she or he has to understand the consumer. And, and, and that's why, if that's happening in the right way, that probably should be the person that can, can lead the organization. Um, and, but it has to be a well-rounded uh, CMO. It has to be someone that understands not only, again, the consumer, but what are the implications for the business. Not everything that is good for the consumer in the short term is good for the business. Typically, in the long term, it is. But in the short term, you have to make some choices. So, uh, that is something that you need to have someone that is able to understand those nuances, both the short term and the long term. So industries like FMCG, I think um, CMO should be uh, aspiring to lead the company. I think it's the, the right thing. Um, but there are other industries where it gets a bit more, more complicated, where there's um, financial institutions, for example. There's a set of things that it's just, you, you can definitely understand the consumer, but there's so many details around other things, other aspects of the business that perhaps would be a bit more challenging to assume that the CMO would take the role. Uh, but in a good chunk of industries, I think it's, it's, it's true, uh, given the, the importance of what understanding consumer means. I appreciate the time you've spent with us, and uh, I really appreciate uh, you know, your, your, your wisdom and, and your years of experience are showing through. And, uh, and I think your success shows through in the answers that you've provided to us. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be um, excited to, to listen to this and, and to learn from it. So thank you very Antonio, much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right. If you found something new, interesting, or helpful in this video, share it with someone else to help them in their journey to improve and succeed.